The United States created the global order at the end of World War II so we could fight the Soviets. We made the world safe for commerce in exchange for military alliances to fight the Cold War. On this map kind of gives you an idea of who was who. The blue were the countries that we cared about before World War II. The green were the new allies in the new Bretton Woods global order, globalization. The yellow are what really matter because those are the countries that switched sides to join us and our global market in exchange for them flipping against the Soviets. But that war ended 30 years ago. Now, the countries that benefit the most from this system were the countries that it didn't do well before. Either they were resource poor like the Germans and they couldn't challenge the naval powers, or they had weak geographies like the Chinese, which turned them into prey for the empires. For the first time in their existence, countries like China could access resources and markets without having to secure them militarily because we took care of that. But making this system work required that the United States had troops everywhere to protect the sea lanes, to keep the Soviets at bay, to prevent the members of our alliance from picking fights with one another. But we're done. What we've got here is total U.S. deployments overseas going back to World War II. As you can see, it's been trending down a long time. It's not that the United States is trying to decide whether it should leave. We've already left. The global order is now purely running on inertia. And anyone who's betting on globalization today is kind of betting on buggy whips about 10 years after the Model T started rolling off the line. So that's piece one. The global system cannot function without the United States, and the U.S. has already left. Let's talk about the second piece, demography. Now, what we've got here is a standard demographic profile. Children at the bottom, then young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top. Mortality tends to build it into a pyramid. Now, this is Mexico. This is what we call a consumption-led demographic. Because whenever you have a bulge in your population structure, roughly below age 40, it's all about the spending on cars and kids and college and homes. Now, when American political leaders and business leaders look at a demography like Mexico, we really like what we see. Two big reasons. First of all, expertise. When you're 40 and under, you're relatively new at your career. Your value add is relatively low. So the Mexicans excel at assembly and low-end manufacturing. That's not what Americans do well. We do design. We do the high end. So the possibilities of integrating supply chains between those two systems are great. Second, consumption. All those young Mexicans absorb a lot of goods, including American agricultural output. So the propensity for trade between the United States and Mexico is huge. Mexico became our largest trading partner in calendar year 2019. It's a position they will not give up in our lives. But look at the bottom of that pyramid from roughly age 25 down. You'll notice it just kind of drops off. The same thing that has happened in Germany and in Norway and the United States is people move into urban environments, they have fewer kids. The same thing is happening in Mexico which means that net migration from Mexico to the United States has now been negative for 10 straight years. And that's simply because they are starting to have fewer young people. You should count on that continuing forever. And it's not just Mexico. Here's the combined demography of the Central American states. They're facing exactly the same thing, but from five years later in time. So the inflows of labor that we've seen into everything, semi-skilled, unskilled labor from south of the border going all the way down to Panama, it's already peaked. It's only going to fall. I mean, we might get the odd flow here and there after a hurricane like we're seeing right now, but you should not count on labor coming up in the future. It's simply going to shrink from now on. So that's what a consumption-led system looks like. Here's the other thing. This is an export-led system. Now, the Koreans had a baby bust that started 45, 50 years ago. They never recovered. And so now they've got this huge surge of populations in their 50s. Now, people in their 50s have been at their job for two, three decades. They know every in and out of the trade. They're very productive, very high value add, which means that Korean products are going head to head with American products. But even worse, 
there aren't a lot of people in their 20s and 30s in Korea. So all that production has to be exported. So we will never have a trade relationship with the Koreans that is what we would consider equitable. Demographics prevent it. So Mexico we see as a partner, but Korea we see as a competitor. Now, from the point of roughly 1980 until roughly 2015, the world as a whole was in this wonderful demographic moment. All of the world's major economies were either consumption-led or export-led. Here's a bunch of the major ones back in the year 1980, I'm sorry, in the year 2000. And as you can see, everything was kind of in balance. And in the heyday of globalization with the Cold War over and the Americans still holding up the ceiling and making everything flow, it was great for trade expansion. And this is the world we've all become used to. But 20 years later, we are all 20 years older. And that global demographic of high consumption was already ending. The export-led economies are aging into mass retirement in a kind of a post-growth scenario. And the consumption-led economies are aging into export-led economies, but there's no one to export to. The real kicker is that the year 2022 was when all this flips. That's the year that most of the world's export-led economies age into post-growth. And most of the consumption-led economies age into export. So the whole balance is to skew. And the entire economic model that we have based everything upon for the last 60 years no longer applies. Now, for the United States, we are kind of in the middle. Uh, the real difference is our baby boomers. Now, they will age into mass retirement in the year 2022 on average, along with everybody else in the advanced world. That's not what makes the boomers special. What makes the American boomers special is they did something that a few other boomers in the world did. They had children. We have something that the rest of the advanced world lacks. We have the millennials. And I, I can't believe that I'm saying this, but the millennials will probably save us all because their consumption today is fueling growth. In fact, their consumption since the financial crisis is what kept us out of recession. We probably would have had three industrial recessions since then, if not for the millennials. And as the millennials age into their 40s and eventually 50s a decade from now, they will start providing the tax base and the investment capital that drives everything else. And nobody else has that. Let me give you an idea of scale. This is the world's consumption-led economies stacked up in terms of GDP today. Here's where we're going to be 10 years from now. So it's a moderate drop, not catastrophic, but not great. But here are the export-led economies. Now, today, we only have one post-growth economy. That's Japan. But if you fast forward 10 years, folks, global production has already peaked. Global capital supplies have already peaked. Global consumption has already peaked. And they will now steadily, or in some cases catastrophically, drop off over the course of the next several years. And they will not recover in our lifetimes. Remember, you want to grow a 30-year-old consumer, it takes 30 years. And that was before coronavirus.